And then the, the, the last little bit, he says, um, he says, uh, there's no higher praise than to, to trust you. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from knowing that you are with me. Uh, so really, really good and, and really great that you prepare our hearts for the passage we're going to look at, at and some of the things we're going to think about tonight. So if you have a Bible, open it up, switch it on, whatever's easier for you. And we're going to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, I'm going to start in verse 22. And this is what it says. So immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord of the Jew, Peter replied, let me tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I wonder, have you ever felt out of control? And how does that make you feel? When you realise that you can't control or affect a particular circumstance or situation in your life how do you react to that and perhaps there's some examples maybe popping into your head right now things have gone in the past or maybe there's something going on right here and now tonight that you're walking through a life moment and i think that everybody in this room would agree that there's moments like that when we can't control them they feel really scary we don't like not being in control of anything but the reality is that we will all at some point in our lives find ourselves in those particular moments when we have no control. And when those moments come, the way I see it, we've got two choices. So we can freak out or we can trust. I just got back from New York. I was away at a friend's wedding. That's the first time that I've been on a plane since the pandemic. So just over two years since Hannah and I actually came back from getting engaged in New York. And traveling on planes for me are moments when I truly feel out of control. So when I was a kid, uh, my mum, who's worked for TUI, the travel agent, for like 20, 25 odd years, uh, she won a holiday to St. Lucia, right? And even though I was there like over 20 years ago, this island in the, in the Caribbean is so beautiful. I can still like vividly remember it. So I was seven, it was unreal, absolutely beautiful. But while we were there, there was this really violent hurricane <laughs> that was ripping through the Caribbean, come all the way over from Africa, it was ripping through. And even though it had just missed St. Lucia, all these sort of storms were all littered all around the islands as we were preparing to leave. So we missed the main bit, but there was still lots of danger hanging about. And long story short, when we went to flew, fly home, we flew through a thunderstorm. <laughs> and it was really scary, <laughs> really, really mad. And I can still remember that. And it put me off flying for years, years and years. And actually, it's probably still put me off a bit. I still got on planes for our family holidays. We still had those when I was a kid. I still went on for traveling with my mates to watch football. Later on, I got on for work, but I hated it. I sat on edge the whole time. I felt every bump and any turbulence, any even slight or big, was a throwback to those really bad memories. And the thing, the thing that scared me the most about those times was I had absolutely no control, no influence, no insight. I felt like I was literally putting myself, my whole life into somebody else's hands. And there were times where I like genuinely prepared to get on those planes and thought like, this is it, I may die. <laughs> this, is, this is the end for me. I had to get prepared every single time I went on a plane. <laughs> Our passage tonight will be an incredibly familiar one to a lot of you in this room. And I'm sure many of you in here have read it many more times than me, but it's very, very familiar to me because I read this passage like ritually every single time I get on a plane. And I would love to tell you that since I became a Christian that God has stripped me from my fear of flying, 
that the moment I became a Christian, it was just being supernaturally like stripped off and removed, and I fly like carefree, like don't care anymore, it's great. But I don't. <laughs> I really don't. I've improved, I've got a lot better, and prayer helps. This is a big tip for anything in life. But I don't fly far from carefree. I mean, that happens to some folks, and it can just be lifted off supernaturally, but it hasn't happened for me. But I feel like moments like this, when I feel totally out of control, I feel like the Lord is actually building something more valuable in me than just hand here, just remove that silver bullet, done, done and dusted. But I feel like in those wee moments, trivial or serious to you, that he's actually teaching me to trust him. And what I want to suggest to you from this passage we just read tonight, and which we're going to go over now, is that Jesus teaches us to trust him by demonstrating that he is Lord of and in the storms and in those out of control moments of our lives. In the moments when we feel no control whatsoever, he can teach us to trust him by demonstrating his power, his presence, and his grace, and proving in his character that he's reliable, that he's trustworthy, and that he's good. And I want to challenge you and try and convince you tonight that actually out of control is a good place and that's a place where we would like to be, where we should be. So we jump into this story just after Jesus has fed 5,000 men and countless others with five loaves and two fish. But before the disciples can digest that miracle, Jesus ushers them all into a boat on the Sea of Galilee and he tells them, go on ahead to the other side of the lake and wait for me. Jesus wraps things up with a crowd of people that he's just fed and he proceeds to, t- to climb up this really high mountain nearby to pray by himself. And we see this time and time again in the gospel. Seeking solitude and time alone to pray is part of the rhythm of Jesus' ministry of engaging and then retreating and engaging with people again. It's so, so important to him. But when he's up on this mountainside, he can also see the disciples out on the lake. And in Mark's gospel, kind of written that Jesus could see the boat in the night struggling out on the waves and in the high winds and the sea of galilee is really really far below sea level and it's surrounded by all these hills and mountains if you imagine almost like a teacup like that and as soon as like a little weather front comes in no matter how strong or like these huge winds can just whip up so a storm can appear really calm one second and then the next minute it's just like the waves are on it's just flying in like be really really scary and even though it's not portrayed in the passage it would have been a really really scary situation for even experienced fishermen like the disciples who would have been out on this sea all the time and i'm pretty confident to say that this is an instance when they would have felt little to like zero control and jesus can see them struggling throughout the night but he doesn't go down on the lake he waits until dawn before walking out and i always thought well why you know, he can see them, he see them struggling, he sees them difficulty here, but why is, he, why is he waiting? Is that a test for the disciples? Is this another opportunity he's waiting for to teach them something new? And test or opportunity, I don't know. But I know that Jesus is able to take the present storms of our lives and in that moment and use them, no matter how scary they are, to reveal something of his character and his presence to us. But if I was really pushing, and this is what I've thought again as I've read this passage time and again, get on the plane, well, why then does he not just intervene right away? Like if that's his motive, if that's what he really wants to show, if that's really what the intention is, well, why not just come down right away? And I've never been able to answer that question. But perhaps not knowing is the point because we can't always explain God's timings and things, his action or inaction in our lives, but instead we have to learn to trust him. And Jesus knows that for the disciples and for us, To really trust him requires serious effort. And trusting is always easier said than done. It's not a one-off event of saying, I've got it and that's it. It's a daily choice and it's one that we have to make by reminding ourselves of stories like this, which show Jesus' character, his power, his presence, who he is. And it's stories like this that we have to remind one another of time and time again. Because the miracles of Jesus, they have this really intriguing quality about them they're not just demonstrations of power and authority even though that's really cool and i love that but they actually show us something about god's moral character actually who he is and choosing to walk across three and a half miles of water to get out of this boat is really really strange and really really unusual but there's a real purpose to it for jesus 
And sure enough, whenever the disciples first spot Jesus out on the water, remember I had those two choices, freak out or trust. What do they do? They freak out. They're like, who is this? That's a, that's a ghost. There's a ghost out here in this water. And there's all the wind and the waves and all the craziness out here. Now we're getting haunted by ghosts. And Jesus calls out to him. He's like, hold on, stop. He says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. I find it really curious. He says, doesn't say his name. He says, it is I. And it's almost like he actually expected them to recognize him, like recognize who he was. He just assumes this like familiarity. And everybody in this room can understand familiarity like that. For example, my wife has a terrible habit of calling me on a withheld number, right? So from time to time, in her job, she has to make uh, really like serious calls, being all professional, needs to withhold her number, call up, you know, have the discussion. And the thing is that she never turns her number back on. So every time I've got to get into the habit where if I see a withheld number, I'm not going, oh no, this is something really terrible or however news or someone trying to spam or scam me. It's, it's probably, it's probably how. But even still, I still, have to, I still have to lift it up and to investigate to try. So we see my, well, my phone says, you know, withheld. Okay, right, let's go. And I lift up. As soon as I hear that initial hello on the other end, it's her. I just know it. Like straight away, like the tone of her voice, just, I just know that initial first, first syllable, first word, it's her, 100%. And everybody in this room can tell exactly the same thing of their spouse, their close family, probably most of their friends. Now what if we could learn to familiarize God speaking to us in exactly the same way? And I'm not talking just about an audible voice. I'm talking about having such a familiarity that comes from having a close relationship to Jesus that we are able to recognize and sense God's presence and know him speaking into our daily lives, every moment, every situation. Imagine having that immediate assurance that he is present and that he is with us. And it's that familiarity and close relationship which we can obtain when we come to know Jesus and as we learn to trust him more and more. And the result of that trust becomes like those close personal relationships in our lives. Since we left the phone, hello, I know it's you. One of my spiritual heroes, Dallas, Dallas Willard, he, he puts it like this. People, that's us, we are meant to live in an ongoing conversation with God. Speaking and being spoken to. And it's that ongoing conversation, that, that personal day-to-day, moment-by-moment relationship that we should long for, which we can have. And it's the result of us learning to trust Jesus, to take him at his word. It's easy, right? Except, (laughs) it's really, really not. Trust is hard. It's really hard to build, and it's even harder to maintain. And Peter, he demonstrates that for us first in this passage. He calls out to him, he says, Lord, if that's you, well, tell me to come to you in the water. And I think Peter thought he recognized that voice initially, but maybe he couldn't see in the storm or in the waves. It was just the spray was going all over the place. Maybe he just couldn't quite work it out. Or maybe he actually just couldn't believe what his eyes were actually showing him. Just seeing Jesus out standing on, on the water. But Jesus' answer is decisive. He says, come. Come on then, come. And here's the difficult thing about trust. It takes faith to build it. And faith, as the Hebrews writer says, is confidence in what we hope for. An assurance about that which we don't see yet. We literally are putting ourselves into somebody's, somebody else's hands and we are taking their word at the outcome of it. But the most difficult thing about trust, the most difficult thing, is that we cannot build it until we step out in faith. And this means we don't always know and we can't always see what the outcome will be. Instead, again, we learn to rely on what somebody else tells us the outcome will be. And only when Peter steps out of the boat, only when he actually gets out of it, does he realize that he's able to do something extraordinary and supernatural. But he only found out, he only found out by getting out of the boat and taking that step of faith at Jesus' word. If he didn't step out of the boat, he would never have known what was possible with Jesus. And it's exactly the same for us. If we aren't prepared to exercise faith 
and to try and understand what it means for us to step out in our own circumstances, we can't build that trust in him. And then what about the rest of the story? Well, Peter was doing so well. He was doing so well. He got out of this boat, standing on the water, looking across at Jesus. It must have been an absolutely amazing moment to witness and to see. But when he catches sight of the storm and the waves and everything else that's going on around him and what he was doing, he got scared, as you would. And it seems that that initial trust and faith has actually left him. And he begins to, to sink. Now in my life, as I'm sure with many of you guys in this room, trusting God has rarely, rarely been a straightforward experience for me. There are doubts and there's fears and there are wonderings and failures and questions. And they can all stretch our trust. I think even attack it and undermine it. We can be our worst enemy in that sometimes. And if you do feel that way, that way too, or you haven't even begun to trust Jesus yet, that's okay. Because again, stories like this that we have to come back to to build our trust, to reassure us, to bring us back to that again. And I want to point out to you that Peter begins to sink, but he doesn't drop. Why doesn't he just drop like a stone in that moment of his, when his faith actually failed? You see, to me, if this miracle relied on Peter's faith, then surely when his faith failed, then that was it. It was game over. But the thing is, building trust doesn't require a level or amount of faith on our part. It's all about who we put our faith in. It's about the object of our faith. Who or what do you trust? And Peter trusted Jesus' invitation to walk on water with him. And then he did it. The miracle, see, it doesn't rely on Peter. It relies on Jesus' word. That's how it happens. And now when Peter's in trouble, he cries out to Jesus, save me. And immediately, like immediately, Jesus reaches out and he catches him. And to me, like, this is the most encouraging part of the story. <laughs> the failure, the hard bit, this is the most encouraging part. And why? Because even when we stumble, even if we think we've messed it up, even if we think we've failed, Jesus is able and he's willing to catch us and pick us up again. I honestly think that Peter sinking, not just dropping, game over, was actually part of God's grace in this situation. Because Jesus didn't let him drown and he was never going to. That's because he's trustworthy. He can be relied upon. He's present. He's good. And he can and he is willing to pick us up again and again and again. He is grace for our stumbles and our fears, our doubts and our failures. Stepping out in faith, it doesn't always mean success. It doesn't always mean that things are going to work out or work out better than we even thought. In fact, sometimes it can end in failure. But no matter what happens, we can trust that Jesus, again, he's present, he's good, and that he can catch us when we fall and he is able to pick us up again. But it's only, it's only when we step out in faith and trust him, no matter what the outcome might be, that we can really begin to truly appreciate that. But then you might say, what about Jesus' comment to Peter as he pulls him out of the water? He says in verse 31, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? You think, ooh, seems harsh. This is a bit of a telling off here. It's a bit difficult from Jesus. He might even think everything that I've said so far, well, is Jesus not just torpedoed all of that? What are we going to make of this? Well, to be honest, it, it doesn't feel like harsh. And it doesn't feel like a telling off to me. Because Peter had done so, so well up to this point. You think about everybody else. Everybody else has sat in the boat. Nobody else has said a word. Nobody else is prepared to step out. But he had done so, so well. And I think really what Jesus is trying to get across to him, what he's really trying to say is, you don't need to doubt or be afraid. I'm here. I've got you. Trust me. And this is a moment that Peter, and by extension we, are learning to trust Jesus. And again, Jesus knows that that is not an easy thing. He knows that it requires serious, ongoing effort on our part. And you know what? It's not always going to be perfect. But he also knows that as we know him more and more, as we gain that familiarity, that relationship 
with him that our trust becomes deeper and closer in him and we begin to understand actually what it means to walk with him moment by moment day by day situation by situation by faith with him does that mean that we can't still doubt no of course not we can and in all likelihood we will and the problem the problem with doubt to me especially in, in christian circles is it can be taken as a bit of a curse word it's a bit of a taboo sometimes we don't talk about our doubts and we can struggle to open up and deal with them because we actually fear what others will think of us but we have to be able to change our attitudes on doubts and on doubters because doubts they're not missiles to our trust just willing to blow it up take it out of the water end it no not at all doubts are invitations for us to grow to mature and to be nurtured in our faith in jesus everybody everybody including me will have their doubts at some point but the challenge and the question for us is how do we deal with them you know i love the story in, in luke chapter 7 and uh, john the baptist he's in prison at this point and he says to his disciples to go to jesus and basically say go make sure it's him you know should we are you actually the messiah or should we expect somebody else and the two disciples go along they find jesus out teaching and ministering in the wilderness and they give john's message and jesus thinks about it for a second he says go back to john and tell him the blind see and the lame walk and the dead are raised to life now and that that is a direct quote from the book of isaiah in isaiah chapter 35 and in that specific chapter in chapter 35 those are signs that isaiah prophesied that when the messiah will appear these are the things that will happen so you know what these two disciples go back to the prison and john's like well what did he say they're like, well, he said, you know, he told us this, you know, the, lame, uh, the lame walk and the blind see and the dead are raised to life again. John knows straight away. He's like, that's him. That's the guy. That's him. Time out. It's over. You see, when we doubt, when we question, we have to bring those to Jesus. Don't walk away with them. Don't lose patience if they aren't answered right away. But if we bring them to Jesus... We will learn to trust him more, as John did, not less. So as we come in, sort of bring it down to a close, we think again about our initial question at the start. Have you ever felt out of control? And again, what if that was a good thing? What if instead of trying to control everything, we actually learned to give control of our lives over to Jesus? And it seems to me that that should be the goal of us learning to trust and to put our faith in him daily. And that is a very, very good thing because we actually need to appreciate how little of our lives we actually control. We live in a really uncertain world with these powerful forces that can change and shape and end our lives. And we know that really, really well because we just lived through a pandemic. We're just thrown in the most uncertainty any most of us in this room have ever faced and will probably ever face ever again in our lives. The reality is that no matter how much we try to control our lives, even with all the care and detail in the world, things always come up. Sometimes good, not always bad, sometimes not so good. Life happens, said John Lennon, when we're making other plans. So let me encourage you, for the first time, or for the thousandth time, or for the hundredth thousandth time, for some of you here, here not assuming any ages at all, to put your trust in Jesus. Let him teach you to trust him. Let your life be an ongoing conversation with the Son of God, the Lord of the universe, the one who, and through whom everything has been made and through whom everything holds together. Don't be put off by fears or doubts or failures. There is grace available. And someone who wants to show you that he's present, that he's good, and that we can rely on him and trust in him. When we learn what it means to step out in our own circumstance, circumstances, we can realize the power of God working in us and we can do extraordinary things, things that actually we never even thought were possible in the first place. And that isn't only for our benefit, but actually it ends up being for the benefit of others and for the glory of God. And we see this at the very very end of our passage. Because as Jesus hauls Peter back into the boat with the other disciples, those who have been witnessing the whole thing, they're in shock. And the only thing they can say is, you are the son of God. And they begin to worship. 
And worship is always a response to, to what you recognize, what you know. They, they start to worship him. And they start, starts to dawn on them that actually God himself has been with them the whole time already. Because God created the sea and the wind and the waves. So if someone shows up and casually starts walking on the water and then gets into the boat and tells the wind and the waves to simmer down, they have to be God. <laughs> no other way around it. That's why they respond that they do. It's like, truly, you are the son of God. It can't be anybody else. But they never, ever would have realized that if Peter didn't get out of the boat. And it's moments of stepping out in faith which teach us to trust and that, they, that sustain us through our lives, whatever comes. And it's in those moments in which God's power and grace and goodness is truly displayed for us. And just for a closing prayer, I'll tell you one, one last story with this. I told you that my fear of flying isn't quite complete yet, but it's got better over the years. And there was a time a few years ago when uh, I'd been over visiting a friend in England, really short flight coming home. And I ended up sat down in like a random seat beside this, this young guy. And uh, we're just coming back and I was just reading my usual passage, getting into it, and just flicking through short flight, like 45, 50 minutes or whatever. But this young guy, you know, sometimes I chat to people on planes, but he was just very quiet. But he kept on kind of looking over at me and then looking up, kind of looking over, looking up. And this went on for a bit. So about the last 10 minutes into the flight, we're just like sort of getting in descending. And he just had to throw away Mark, he's remark. He just said, oh, pointed down to the Bible. He's like, oh, you've got everything together then? And I was like, well, no, that's why I'm reading this. <laughs> and uh, he just started to open up. He just started to open up and started to chat. And really what happened was he was just having a really hard time in uni. A really difficult time, some things personally for things, some stuff in the study. And he was coming home to like make a make or break decision, like how do I go on? Like where do I go from here? And we were just chit chatting on the ground on my back, started talking a little bit, bit about Jesus, started praying for him. And next thing before before I knew that, we we're just started chatting, praying, and the next thing I knew we were on the ground. I was like, great, we're on the ground, awesome, no problem. I was walking through the terminal, I was up with my other friends as we were walking through. And they were like, my goodness, did you feel that on the way down? That was, that was horrendous. Oof, that was really bumpy. That was really rough on the way down. That was horrible. Like, yeah, no, that was the worst land I've had. And I could have came into the group and I was like, what are you talking about? So that was, that was sweet. That was easy. There was no bother. Absolutely no problem. And what I actually realized was because I was sitting talking about Jesus the whole time, I didn't notice at all. And actually the plane had come down nearly sideways in these high, in these high winds. And if I hadn't even been talking praying or had that opportunity at that moment, I would have been freaking out. <laughs> but it was only for just talking, chance encounter or not, talking about Jesus with this guy, I didn't even notice because my eyes were fixed on him. So let me encourage you that, guys. No matter what you're walking through, no matter what is going on, if we keep our focus and our trust in him, if we're prepared to do that daily or even just inadvertently as I did, there's nothing intentional about that kind of encounter, we will be able to trust him. We will be able to walk through the moments and the storms and the difficulties of our lives. So let's learn to trust him. Let's close in prayer. <coughs> Jesus, I pray that you would teach us to trust you. I thank you for moments like this when you display your power and your authority, but also your goodness and your grace, Lord. And I pray that, Lord, um, no matter what we are walking through, Lord, I pray that you would help us to know you speaking into our lives day and daily, Lord. Help us to be in that ongoing conversation with you, speaking, Lord, but also listening and knowing, Lord, that you're present and that you're with us. Jesus, thank you that you're able to pick us up again. And Lord, thank you that you're willing to catch us. Lord, we admit and we confess, Lord, that we have so little control of our lives, but Lord, instead of freaking out in fear, Lord, we choose now to trust you, and Lord, to give um, our lives to you, Lord. And Lord, even when it's difficult and even when it's hard, Lord, even where there have been doubts and fears and failures, Lord, we give all of those to you now, and Lord, we just pray that you would speak into those, and Lord, pray that you would help us to walk with you and to learn again to trust you and to put our faith, our hope in you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person here. Lord, bless us into this week. And Lord, help us to walk by faith with you in our work, in our lives, in our families, in our situations and circumstances. Lord, please bless us. And Lord, let us know you working and speaking into whatever you would have us be, wherever you would have us, and whatever you would have us do this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you, Matt. And what an encouraging message and a challenging message taken.